What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. My name is Max Hillebrand, and today I welcome onto the show the one and only Peter Todd, who is, well, a wizard with a very, very gray beard and quite a long one, too. Uh, he has been one of the prolific contributors uh, to, well, free software and Bitcoin in general. Uh, and we are talking about what actually got him down that rabbit hole of first starting to use Linux and uh, then all the fascinating insights that he that he reached as a young uh, boy contributing to free software projects. Uh, and ultimately what primed him uh, to understand the value of Bitcoin basically on first sight. Uh, and uh, then adding a lot of his own contributions to the space. Uh, specifically, I would really say with the architecture of how to understand Bitcoin itself and what it actually means to have a double spending protected time stamping server. And with that awesome new magic, what we can actually build. Right? And uh, this means for one things like open timestamps, right? To, to prove that one information has existed at a certain point. Right? Uh, and then things like proof Marshall, <laughs> which basically mean that this was the only thing that was ever set and that you can prove that there has not been a double spending or that one person sets two different things to do different people. Uh, and uh, this, again, is a bit of a, let's say, dense and technical episode, but it really is here to show you that Bitcoin is so much more than just a transactional network for making small payments. This really is a groundbreaking achievement that will enable countless, highly scalable, highly advanced and highly complex systems that we can build on top of it. Uh, so as usual, do not forget to share this important knowledge with your peers uh, who are falling down the rabbit hole alongside you. And of course, don't for forget to leave a like uh, if you actually do enjoy this content. And without any further ado, let's get right into the ninth episode of Join the Wasabi Cast with Peter Todd. So, Peter, you're, of course, one of the very early contributors to Bitcoin. Um, and I'm very curious about the background that actually, like, got you into that mindset to, to discover Bitcoin early and actually start contributing to it. So, uh, how would you say, how did you get into the free software ethos? Ah, oh, free software. You know, I think that, that probably, uh, I, I, I have to go trace it all the way back to, uh, a uh, family member who uh, told me uh, about Linux, actually, way back in high school. And, uh, you know, I, I think from a they that seen it in a Wired magazine article or something, and they just said, hey, the, uh, this kind of looks cool. Like, this is all this fancy software stuff that's just like the commercial stuff. And at the time, that was really the only practical way for, uh, you know, 13-year-old kid to <laughs> get their hands on uh, on Unix. So that's really like one thing led to another. I mean, I wouldn't, at least for that introduction, I wouldn't say it had anything to do with, you know, the free software ethos or anything. I think it's a, that was a very pragmatic thing of, well, how do I get access to interesting software for free? And, you know, it worked out. And as much as that kind of sounds like, well, you know, shareware could do that and so on. I think what makes that free software ethos special is they just figured out the right incentives at the time you know, with the GPL to actually make that software production scale. Aha. So for you, free, free software is about writing, uh, you know, big project works uh, at scale. But, but why is that? Can you go more into it? Well, to be more clear, I'd say free software is, you know, it is about writing that, you know, that ecosystem at scale. Because from my point of view, as a 13-year-old boy, <laughs> way back when, that's what made it possible for me to kind of get into this stuff. You know, it's, it, it made it, it made it interesting versus the shareware movement. It was all these little kind of annoying programs. They didn't really interact with each other that well. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't an ecosystem so much. It was a bunch of small scale businesses trying to make a buck on a small scale. You know, and it's, I'd say it's ironic how free software what it really succeeds at is leveraging capitalism on a much bigger scale, you know, because it's, because it happens to use these special economics of software 
to find ways to make much bigger entities cooperate to extract a huge amount of you know revenue while at the same time giving away something for free. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that's interesting, right? And so that aspect of scale, of course, seen with your example, that you, you would have no chance to get into some proprietary closed source think tank right, as a 13-year-old high school kid. Right? Yeah. But on the contrary, it was trivial to just you know get some Linux, GNU, uh, GNU Linux version and run it and look at the code and see what's happening yeah. and then start to contribute back. Right? So yep. uh, that aspect of scaling who can actually contribute to the free software is uh, is obvious. Well, and it's funny. I mean, people often criticize this idea of contributing back as, you know, unrealistic, like no one could do it, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, every time I've run into a problem with free software, that was something that could be fixed in a reasonable amount of time. You know, I've actually wound up going and going to the source code, fixing it, and then contributing things back. You know, though my name is on a surprising amount of random software packages because I had some small problem and I wanted to get it fixed. You know, it's it's it works as well. Like, that aspect of contributing back works as well as it possibly could. You know, obviously, if you're if you have a much harder problem, like I mean, you know, suppose I have a piece of hardware, right, and I need a driver rig for it. You know, I'm probably not going to do that on a weekend. But then again, if I was a company, I absolutely could go hire some programmers, just get that done. And I've seen this happen. You know, I mean, I, I know of examples where that's actually happened in real life because some company needed some free software written. And because it wasn't their core competency, you know, they weren't going to try to sell the software. They just want it written and, you know, get that problem solved. Yeah, that's the core of it, right? The scratch your own it, uh, your own itch ethos. Yeah. That, uh, the, and that's a really cool incentive. Right? Because you don't need a monetary incentive to do work if you're suffering a serious problem yourself right now. Right? Just the fact well, that you have... Well, in fact, I would, I would push back a little on that. There is a monetary incentive to get that to work, which is your company, and you will make money if this problem is solved. <laughs> okay, yes, well, well, that's true. Yeah, But nobody pays you directly to fix just that problem. Right, so it's it's more about. Um, well, you know, you say, I, I, I've seen I've seen companies go hire programmers, go fix free software problems. Yeah, you know, that, that that is not an uncommon scenario. Yeah, exactly. And right, it's, it's, like it does... I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I, I really push back on people portraying this as anything to do with, you know, well, I mean, free isn't free, free isn't beer, right? You know, I, I think people really misunderstand how commercial this actually, you know, this stuff actually is. But it works because where free software fits in is things that aren't companies' core competencies. Right? That's mm-hmm. why all the sharing actually makes sense. Yes, right. That's uh, is it's just as we as all entrepreneurs use the the tooling, the technology. Um, yes. It improves each of their efficiency uh, in solving yep. the problems yep. and therefore increases the division of labor again, right? All of a sudden, all your peers are more productive and have more yep. time to fix your problems too. Yep. Right. And, and I'll point out this, this ethos is something you actually see in non-software industries. It's, it isn't as common because it's not as easy, but you know, th- there's example of uh, hardware specifications, which are effectively work the same way as free software. I mean, there's been examples of this prior to free software existing. And, you know, more recently, I mean, you get things like companies contributing to, you know, as example, server hardware standards, because they all have a shared problem of they need to run servers at scale. And they want to make sure that they can go buy hardware that does what they need. You know, the designing server hardware isn't their core competencies, but they still contribute back to these specifications. Because it, it, you know, it's in their best interest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I think then, right, as, as an entrepreneur, if if you're using free software, and first of all, you have a benefit to make sure that that software actually works because you're using it to earn money, and, and yep. uh, that also means if you improve it, right, you will earn more money. And with yep. the beauty of software being non-scarce, so that you can just give away that idea and copy it, right, uh, you still retain all the benefits of the new, better version of the software. Well, oh, everyone else does too, for free. Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the, also, I think w- w- what's made it especially interesting is uh, security. 
you know, like the way software security works is quite unique in that it's become based on this idea of you want a system that's secure even if your adversary knows how it works. You know, that, like that, that is a new thing in the entire history of security. Well, that fits perfectly with free software because it actually makes the thing that's free and completely open for anyone to look at, anyone to inspect, anyone contribute actually more valuable than the alternative where you're always wondering, all right, you know, what backdoors have they gone and put into it? You know, for anything where security matters, free software has this almost insurmountable advantage. And it's, you know, it's inherent to the, the free is in freedom aspect of it. You know, it's, it's a quite unique thing. And there aren't good parallels to, you know, to it happening before because software uh, security is just special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's somewhat analogous to, to having some defensive strategy. Uh, well, it makes sense to, to talk with others about that strategy, right? And to see if the strategy actually makes sense. Right? Yep. Um, and I mean, it, it's maybe even a bit counterintuitive, right? Because others might say, well, why would you share your defensive strategy with someone, right? If, if you could have just keep it a secret and then no enemy knows how to, like, you know, what you're going to do. Uh, so, so what about that? Which I'll, I'll point out is a completely valid objection in prior examples of security. You know, when you're talking about prior forms of security for, you know, basically before cryptography existed, it made perfect sense to hide your security details when, you know, you're talking about defending, uh, you know, defending a warehouse from thieves. But what's unique about software security, you know, in conjunction with cryptography, is we can make systems where if they work, they're effectively infinitely secure. You know, and an analogy I actually used in a talk once was when computer security and, you know, cryptography works correctly, it's like responding to the threat of attack by wolves by building a moon base. And your only concern then is the wolves somehow develop opposable thumbs and invent rocketry to go over to your moon base. Whereas when your computer security doesn't work, it's like doing all that and then coming back in your Soyuz capsule and crashing, uh, you know, 100 kilometers uh, off targets and ending up, uh, you know, stuck all night long uh, in the woods somewhere with wolves surrounding you. You know, like that, that's, I, I think that that's a great analogy because it really gives you a sense of just how strong this stuff is, yet also how weak it is when it goes wrong. And Physical security just has no precedent like that. You know, there is no physically secure system where you can say, yes, this is uncrackable. You know, no matter how much effort anyone puts into it, they'll never be able to break into this. You know, safes just don't work that way. Like your bank vault, the difference between the weakest bank vault in the world and the strongest bank vault in the world is far less orders of magnitude than the difference between the weakest crypto in the world and the strongest. You know, the weakest crypto in the world is worthless. The strongest, it will never be broken, no matter how far humanity advances. You know, that, that's probably the, how far you get. The weakest bank vault world, the strongest is probably a difference of, you know, a couple days work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the beauty of cryptography, right? And, and this weird science of mathematics, uh, that makes this magic possible. Yeah. And so how did your view on free software kind of change? as you were falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I I wouldn't really say it changed much. I would more say that I think it sort of reiterated my reasoning for why this stuff matters. You know, it's it's one thing to know sort of in theory why, sec you know, why free software for security related things make sense. It's sort of another thing to like really see it firsthand and like actually be immersed in that for a while. But then again, I mean, I was interested in cryptography for much longer than I've been uh, doing stuff with Bitcoin. So I guess you kind of say I'd already gone into that mindset well before Bitcoin, you know. So to me, it just didn't feel like much of a change. Uh -huh, interesting. Um, but uh... I'd already drunk the Kool Aid, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's great, right? To to have a nice preparation before even falling down the rabbit hole kind yeah. of makes you well equipped for the journey. Yeah. Well, you know, it's notable how a lot of people, when they were first introduced to Bitcoin, their first reaction was, 
oh, I mean, how would this ever work? Like, why would it ever be valuable? Whereas my reaction was, oh, shit, I should have thought of that. <laughs> yeah, obvious in hindsight. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, but is that more about the, like, the general architecture of it or even down into the nuances? Well, so uh, I think there's sort of two things that kind of prepared me mentally for Bitcoin. One is having a dad who's an economist and completely understanding how, you know, fake money is. And, and it's notable how when I told him about Bitcoin, he got it immediately too. You know, he didn't understand necessarily why the tech would work, but why the economics would work, it just seemed obvious to him. And, you know, it's pretty obvious to me. I mean, if you have something which has these right properties, obviously it could be valuable. You know, there's, there's really no question about that. But the tech side of it, you know, has kind of become well known. I mean, I, I tried to go invent uh, Bitcoin in high school and, uh, I got fairly far along on a wrong approach. So I was, you know, I, I'd already kind of thought through a lot of these problems and me seeing proof of work and how those incentives worked and how the verification worked. It, you know, it's just one of those things where I looked at the first, I was like, oh, shoot, yeah, obviously that would work. Can you identify like the, the logical point where you, where you started going down the wrong path? Yeah, well, so my attempt to uh, invent Bitcoin, um, the farthest along I'd gotten was the idea of using a distributed hash table as a mechanism to sort of store coins or sort of store information about coins. But where I re like what I really kind of missed there, I think, comes down to putting too much focus on this idea of proof of work minting coins and too little focus on the idea of verification of history, you know, verification of how the state of the system has changed. And it's interesting how academia, with their work on consensus systems, has also gotten this wrong. You know, ac academic works on consensus systems focus on how do you get a group of computers to agree with each other, rather than focusing on how do we create a data structure that can be interrogated and checked for its validity by itself. And, you know, the easiest way to describe it is in traditional computer science consensus research, There's no definition of what is or isn't valid. They just try to get things to agree, regardless of whether or not they're valid. Uh -huh, yeah, that's a that's a very nuanced point, right? It's it's not just about getting into agreement about anything, but it's about first verifying for yourself that this is true according to your own rules. Yes, right? and then second, yeah. coming into agreement with other people who have made that same verification conclusion. Yes. And, and where this really shows up is really in scale. Because traditional consensus is focused on getting nodes to agree with each other, you always have the scale problem. Because we don't have a scalable way to get nodes to agree with each other. You know, in, in sort of traditional approaches where we don't have a definition of validity, right? Where the definition of validity lets you scale is that it If you have that and you have a way of verifying someone else's consensus for validity, then you don't need to communicate with them. Or at least you, your communication only needs to be one way. And one way communication is something that scales. You know, it's, it's just copying, right? Uh, wait, wait, wait a second. Can you go a bit more into this? Why is it that it scales more if you, if you can verify it? Well, so. The key thing to understand with how Bitcoin works is Bitcoin security assumption is that you have the ability to learn about a piece of data that exists, right? It's, it's security assumption is basically the reason why file sharing works. Data is trivial to copy and easy to distribute. And once you have that, then the only thing you then need is the ability to decide between two pieces of data as to which one is more valid than the other. And proof of work does that by saying, well, the thing that follows the rules and has the most hashing power, you know, the most work, um, to use a technical term, um, directed at it, that's the one that's valid. That's the one you pick. All right? So you have a you have a tiebreaker rule and you have the ability to copy data. Right. And, bec and because those things do not require communication with entities that created that data, it scales indefinitely. 
you know, me writing a Bitcoin node does not negatively affect your, you know, your use of the consensus. Whereas in traditional consensus systems, it does. Um, like in the sense that if two people run different consensus rules, their networks will no, just... No, I'm not, I'm not talking about different. I'm saying in traditional consensus systems, everyone who joins the consensus changes the, you know, changes the technical parameters for everyone else in the sense that there has to be some communication to stay in consensus, right? So me joining your consensus system slows things down for you and makes things more expensive. Uh -huh. But in Bitcoin, there's no notion of joining because it's just based on copying data. So it doesn't matter how many nodes I run or how many other people exist. You know, that's just completely relevant to you. I mean, it's as relevant to you as how many people happen to be watching, uh, you know, TV broadcasts at the same time. Right? It's just data being, being broadcast. You know, there's no, there's no relationship between the entity creating the data and the entity consuming it. You know, that's the see, you know, seeing that, right? Because data can be copied indefinitely. And traditional consensus systems just don't work that way. Aha. Uh -huh. So is it because in Bitcoin, the verification of a block is not the same as creating a block? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Traditional consensus does not have that distinction. Ah, oh, that's very interesting. So where does that put, or how does, how, how do miners and full nodes then like collaborate together? Where is, is there some tension here? Well, that's it. They don't. You know, there's no collaboration. There is miners produce data and full nodes get a copy of that data. And they may give it back to miners, but that's, you know, that part is secondary. Also, the other thing is the way the consensus system works is such that miners, they don't collaborate with each other either, right? You know, the only collaboration they do is the most minimal possible, which is sort of seeing everyone else's data, right? Like if I find a block, the only collaboration other miners do with me is they may build on top of that block, right? They're not communicating with me directly in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very individualistic protocol, so to say. Right? Yes, it is. Yes, and that's why it scales. Uh -huh. That's very beautiful, actually. Why did you not come up with this, Peter? Come on. Well, because I'm not smart enough, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and honestly, like I, I think... The reason, but like part of why I didn't come up with it is so much of the discussion around these systems was just wrong. You know, academia and all kinds of others mm -hmm. were just going in the wrong direction. And I'm, I think I'm not the only person who my, my chance of coming up with Bitcoin was reduced by exposure to these wrong ideas from academia. Yeah. You know, if you're, it, in, a, if you're like, in a system with different assumptions and with different starting points or even with a different methodology, right? then you will reach vastly different conclusions. Yeah. And those conclusions will be obvious for you, right? But moronic for a, a different yeah. system with different methodology and different assumptions. I mean, often in life, outsiders come up with novel ideas because they're the ones not held back by traditional thinking. I mean, often in life, insiders come up with new ideas too because they understand how the system works. But you need both for, you know, your optimal uh, progression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I mean, let, let's not downplay the, the work that you've done, uh, because you did actually invent a hell of a lot of new things in, in Bitcoin. Um, and I'm, I'm very curious if we can tie the bridge of how we, what we spoke about so far to these new topics. As you said specifically, right, that the verification of this global consensus state is incredibly important. Uh, but where are the, the challenges to that and the, the scalability problems? Well, it, uh... I mean, what, one of the biggest challenges is how do you get, I mean, how do you reliably get two computer programs to do the same thing and spit out the same answer on the same data? You know, that actually turns out to be something that's very challenging. Um, it's quite easy to get one computer program to agree, but, you know, we like to upgrade software. We like to go change things. We like to port things to new systems. And consistently getting the same answer for the same data Turns out to be actually quite difficult. 
I mean, it's, it's hard enough even to define what the same answer is sometimes. You know, it gets into sort of very philosophical arguments, but well, what, what is sameness? <laughs> but from a very sort of practical point of view, I want my Bitcoin node to agree on what is the same best block given the same data available to it. And that turns out to be quite challenging. And part of the learning experience, I think, of Bitcoin for the wider software development world and academia has been understanding just how hard this actually is and how insufficient traditional approaches are. Um, you know, one of the big ones being, and this, you know, you see this over and over in academia, people saying, well, Bitcoin needs a spec, right? You know, Bitcoin needs a specification. Well, traditionally, a specification is something written by humans in English to describe what a system should do. And it turns out we are just not able to write human readable specifications and consistently implement them. You know, what Bitcoin found out is that to write good specs, you have to write them in executable code. You know, that is the only way to nail down these parameters to the extent necessary for consensus system. Uh, this is basically why we've stuck for so long with basically only one mainly used uh, full node software. Uh, yes. And that is the Bitcoin Core full node, right? Yeah, and, it, and it is there, the only way. But, but, but even in that singular project, staying backwards compatible <laughs> like with the older clients is still a, a humongous challenge. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it, it, the fact that is a massive challenge goes and shows how utterly bonkers this idea of human readable English language specs is. You know, we, we, we can barely get two pieces of software that are pretty much the same to agree with each other. How on earth would you ever expect to get two re-implementations to agree with each other? You know, it's just so much, such a harder challenge. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I, I think we have two problems, which is one is, you get a lot of people in the traditional side of things who just don't understand this because they've never dealt with consensus systems. And you also get a bunch of scammers who they see this as a way to get leverage into Bitcoin by you know, putting out new software and claiming that theirs is better, as well as also just denigrating Bitcoin and saying that their altcoin is better for this other, you know, for this other property. And I, I think that happened more in the past than it did and it has more recently, simply because this approach of doing reimplantations has failed over and over and over again, and people are noticing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I've, we've actually experienced in something similar in Wasabi because uh, the backend server uses Bitcoin Knots, which is a fork of Bitcoin Core. Right? Yep. And a lot of things are the same, right? but a lot of different things are, are different. And, and we did experience s several like small hiccups uh, where just our full node said something different than the full node of others. And, yep. and that's a very, very dangerous thing. Now, it, it, all of these problems were usually in the mempool and not on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. It shows you also how unreliable the mempool is. Uh, yep. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely something to consider. Yeah, I mean, if I was running a production system, I'd be very cautious about using even something like Bitcoin Knots. Because it's just, it's so easy to make software disagree, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep, and especially in a consensus uh, system, disagreement is yeah. uh, kind of a bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, even my own uh, Open Time Simps project, you know, would I, like, would I go say that different implementations of Open Time Simps will agree with each other? I'm, I'm reasonably confident that they will agree in the affirmative, which is that if an open time sense proof is not valid, different implementations will consistently say that it is not valid. But if an open time sense proof is valid, uh, you know, I, I think you'd probably find cases where different implementations would disagree on the validity. As in, some would correctly say it's valid, and others would incorrectly say it's invalid. And in open time stamps, that's acceptable for most uses of it because it's not a consensus system. You know, you don't need to agree in both directions of validity, but in a consensus system, you do. You know, consensus system, it is fatal if you say something's valid and I say it isn't. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Uh, but let's maybe pick up the thread uh, of open timestamps because I think this is one of those projects that really shows the magnitude of and the power of Bitcoin. So, wh like, what is the problem that you're trying to solve with open timestamps? Well, so uh, with security software, I make the point that security software is not about solving problems; it is about preventing things from happening. You know, open timestamps doesn't solve a problem so much as it prevents something from happening, which is it prevents people from falsely claiming that data existed in the past. And it does this by being able to prove that data actually did exist in the past. All right. So here's a concrete example. Suppose you have a, a key pair for some, you know, cryptographic signature system and you would like signatures with that key pair to be possible to validate in the future. Well, what could happen in the future? You, you know, your private key might get exposed, right? So what does open time temps do? Well, it lets you prove in the future that your signature on some message exists in the past. And very critically, it ensures that some adversary trying to forge a signature cannot get that validation to go, you know to be correct right mhm mm yeah or in, in other words it kind of proves that something happened right uh and well, no it, not quite it proves when something happened and also there's a very very big catch there was it does not prove that something didn't happen mhm mm yeah right because you only see that one certain piece of information is on the blockchain Right, but you don't see no 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 open timestamps um d does not directly involve a blockchain right like the way open timestamps work is effectively it's a protocol for creating merkle trees right and it creates them collaboratively and the the tip of that Merkle tree that gets created in a period of time, you know, usually about a second, eventually gets timestamped with Bitcoin. But in that whole process, there is nothing unique about this, right? Open timestamp doesn't say that some data didn't exist. It just says this piece of data, we can prove that it's prior to this block. And again, a concrete example of where that distinction matters is, let's suppose I want to go predict the outcome of next year's Super Bowl. Now, if I use open timestamps to timestamp my prediction, that is completely worthless because I could just go and create a prediction for every single possible outcome and timestamp all of them. And then when the Super Bowl happens next year, I just go show which, which of my predictions happens to be the right one. Yeah, that, uh, that's the crux of the issue, right? Um, there, there is not really a, a limit on how many proofs you can make in the past, right? And then only show selectively one of them in the future. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So open timestamps can't solve that problem because open timestamp scales. Uh, why? Uh, okay. Why does that scalability affect the ability to uh, deny that proof? Because I could create an infinite number of proofs. Aha. Uh -huh. So the the ability that creating a new proof is so non-existent. Um, uh, means that I can just whip up as many as I want. So, yep. We, yep. so yep. the solution I, I, to the problem is then... the, the real world cost of an open, of creating one open time sense proof is literally in the like billionths of a penny. You know, it is so small that there really is no limit to how many you could go create. So, uh, then th does that mean that if we increase the cost of creating an open time stamp, we solve that other problem? Well, not really, though, because to increase the cost by an appreciable amount, you really have to use a completely different architecture. You know, o open time stamps is just too good at creating proofs. It's, it's, you know, it's just not the right tool for that job. And, and like very literally, the, the way that the open time stamps proof format works is backwards for the purpose of proving the uniqueness of data. You know, when I say backwards, I, I, I very literally mean the order of operations. You know, the order where cryptographic operations happen is the opposite of what it needs to be for proving uniqueness. 
You know, open timestamp starts at the bottom of this Merkle tree and works its way up. To prove uniqueness, you got to start at the top and work your way down. Uh, maybe dissect these two things a bit more. So, uh, how does actually open timestamp build its Merkle tree? Well, literally starting at the bottom. You know. And so the the bottom uh, has has what all all the, the bottom. Data? The, well, the bottom is individual bits of data that need to be timestamped, right? Like, so as I want to timestamp one of my emails, right? I run a SHA-256 operation on that data that creates a digest. I submit that digest to an aggregation server where multiple other people are doing this at the same time for their own data, and it builds a Merkle tree from, from all those submissions higher and higher and higher. The aggregation server potentially sends that to another aggregation server, which you know builds yet more levels of Merkle tree. And finally, it winds up at the very top of that Merkle tree for that period, which is about one second. And then that tip gets saved indefinitely in its own data structure, and then eventually timestamped to Bitcoin with yet another Merkle tree. And of course, Bitcoin itself then has yet another Merkle tree internal to it, and so on. So in practice, it's something like four or five different layers of Merkle trees, right, getting built from the bottom up. And, and the problem is, is the at every one of those layers, nothing is saying that that tip of that particular part of the tree is unique. It's just saying there is a path from this data to this data. But there are an infinite number of paths that can go from different pieces of data to the same thing. Yeah, and people seriously say that money does not grow on top of trees. <laughs> obviously ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, with, um, w w one follow question, because there is a discrepancy between when I send my hash digest to this aggregating server and when it is then actually put uh, onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So what is the, the trust level or the provability level of the timestamping in between this window? Zero. You know, until until there is a path from your digest to the Bitcoin blockchain, there is no proof of anything. And, and Open Timestamp does this deliberately. I mean, they're an Open Timestamp's aggregator and calendar server doesn't promise anything. It just other you know other than this promise of well, in the future, I pinky swear that I will go timestamp this on Bitcoin. But it doesn't say anything about when the data existed. Or anything like that. It just says, "Hey, you know, in the future, I'll make sure this is timestamped, and I'll I'll make sure you can get access to that data later." Okay, so then practically, it really happens how often the aggregating server goes on chain. Uh, how is that in the real implementation? Like, how often do you actually make a Bitcoin transaction? Ah, uh, the ones I run uh, currently is about every twelve hours. Um, you know, which really comes down to just how much money I'm willing to spend. You know, if I if I do it every six hours, it'll cost more money. And speaking of, I mean, if you want to go donate to them, uh, I could use some more money to go pay for transaction fees. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's then the other kind of, there's still a cost to the thing, right? At least for the aggregator. Um, so the entire operation does, in fact, have some, somewhat of a fixed cost that, that does not that's depend on how thing. many users are there, yeah. right? Yeah, it's fixed. So just somehow you gotta convince the users to toss you more sets. So that is well, a profitable venture. Turns out that's pretty easy. I mean, <laughs> very literally you post on Twitter saying, hey, could someone donate more money to the calendar servers? You know, it, 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 and like, from a practical point of view, there's a web page for every calendar server that it serves up, which has a QR code on it, so you can send money to Bitcoin addresses. And it just keeps its own wallet to use for fees. Simple as that. How about uh, somehow incentivizing other users who are already making a Bitcoin transaction to just include that reference in there? Well, in fact, there's clever crypto you could do, which lets you include that reference for no extra data. But there's two reasons not to do this. One, of course, is that the software becomes a lot more complex. And the other one is I'd rather not make it possible for people to inject data into the calendar databases because that actually becomes an attack um, vector for, you know, kind of bullshit concerns about illegal data. Like, you know, someone, you know, injects a decryption key that's illegal to go and distribute. I mean, 
Bitcoin already has this issue, but I'd rather not also then replicate that on open timestamps. <laughs> you know, because open timestamps gets used in things like, you know, blogging, right, at uh, banks, where it's just it's so much more corporate that you'd just rather not this be an attack vector. It's easier to just go ask, you know, ask for more funds. It's not that expensive to run. You know, it's just a service. It's not that expensive to run. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, but I guess if you want fine grain time stamping, uh, then uh, this, like, this requires even more cost, right? If, like, for example, with logins, you might want to prove, like, up to the, the hour that it happened, might even be the minute, right? And you cannot wait for the entire day. But here's the thing bit, bit, the Bitcoin blockchain just can't provide fine grain time stamping under conservative assumptions. And the reason is because there's very little that actually forces a Bitcoin miner to put the correct time in their block. There's a lot of leeway that they can do to get away with it. So if you, you know, if you had an application where really fine grained time stamping was valuable, it'd be quite easy for a Bitcoin miner to create a block that broke that assumption. Now, within a day, sure, no big deal. Within a few hours, probably fine. But, you know, I, like, in the UI for the open timestamps client, I actually round off the timestamps to the nearest day. Because I think that is an acceptable level of precision to guarantee without further inspection of, you know, basically the blocks that timestamped it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so how does this work that, that you've done on open timestamps? How did that lead you towards, uh, client validated state? Like what, are there any building blocks that go there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, open timestamps is an example of client validated, you know, data. I mean, an open timestamps proof, there is no, you know, th there's no server telling you that it's valid, right? It is a piece of data that you have to run software to validate yourself. Or potentially do it by hand, which is actually quite feasible with, uh, you know, an hour or two at a calculator. But, uh, you know, it, it is data that you validate. And so what information does the validator then need to actually reach a conclusion? Well, so concretely, an open time stamps proof is a tree of operations. Um, and when I say tree, I mean the computer science um, term tree, where you start with a digest and you apply cryptographic operations to that digest in a sequence. Potentially you fork that sequence into two parts or, you know, and so on. And if all those operations, if the end result of those operations happens to be the hash of the Merkle tree in a Bitcoin block header, then you know that your data must have existed prior to when that block header was created. And since a block header has a date field, you know, a time field on it, if you believe that block header is valid, um, you can then, you know, look at that time field to decide when your data probably existed. You know, like the, I just described to you the entire process for validating a uh, open timestamp. Time stamp. Um, now, there is a separate bit where you might retrieve more data from these calendar servers, but that's not, you know, that's not a question of actual validation itself. That's just getting the, getting the data necessary to validate. And what is that other information that you fetch from these servers? Well, so to make the process of creating a time step fast, um, the calendar servers, they record, I think, as I mentioned before, uh, commitments from a Merkle tree built every second. Right. And that lets the latency of creating a timestamp be about a second. So, you know, by default, an open timestamp proof is incomplete. It doesn't have all the data necessary to validate. But when you validate it, it just goes to these timestamp, you know, these calendar servers and requests that extra bit of data and then also happens to go cache it or potentially adds it to the actual proof file itself. And of course, you can download a full copy of that data as well. Um, you know, there's a there's a tool that uh, comes with the Open Timestamps client that mirrors all of this. Uh huh. So maybe that is one important thing to point out with what client-side validated state means. Right? It's that 
if you only have the blockchain itself, like that's far not enough to do the the, the proof itself, right? Which exactly. Is contrary yeah. to how Bitcoin works, right? With Bitcoin, all you need is the blockchain, right, and nothing else. Uh, that is the state that has all the things that you need to validate. Yeah. Um, Which while... is why Bitcoin doesn't scale. You know, mm -hmm. because. Everyone's working off the same data structure, which is all their transactions. So if you have n people using it, there is going to be n squared work done validating it. And in practice, it's actually more than that, but that, uh, that's a whole other discussion of uh, big O notation. But mm -hmm. uh, So how do you actually call this kind of global state or consensus state? Yeah, I think global state uh, or global consensus. Um, you know, it, 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 maybe the way to say it is like what open timestamps does is it lets you extend that global consensus to scale with client side validated data. And the, the important bit is anytime client side validated helps you scale, it helps you scale by being a protocol where you only need to validate a subset of all the data out there. Like quite simply, if you have an open timestamps proof on your data and I don't care about your data, I do not need to validate your part of that of that proof data. It's just not relevant to you. You know, we might have timestamps in the same second and thus ended up in the same ultimate Merkle tree, but your part of the Merkle tree is totally irrelevant to me. Mm -hmm. Right. You you just need the the Merkle inclusion proof, uh, and you don't care about any of the other transaction or timestamp data. Exactly. And open timestamps happens to go a step further than that, which is the actual proof format does not know what a Merkle tree is. You know, the proof format works with very simple operations of append data, prepend data, and hash data. That's it. Now, you can represent a Merkle tree with that, but the proof format doesn't know, if you will, that what it's hashing happens to be a Merkle tree. In fact, sometimes it isn't. Um, you know, as an example, um, if the, the support in open timestamps to timestamp Git commits, parts of it happens to go in hash data that isn't actually in a Merkle tree. Mm -hmm. um, so we use, or how does then the client side valid state that state and the consensus layer, like how do we intermingle them? And I mean, with open timestamps, is it really just that we use it as a timestamping server? With open timestamps, the and in fact, with open timestamps, the proof format, remember, it doesn't even know what a block is, right? The only thing, the only interaction between open timestamps and Bitcoin from the client side is actually block headers, not the blocks themselves. Now, your completely upgraded independent OTS proof will happen to include part of the block, right? It'll include the part of the block Merkle tree that's relevant to your particular timestamp, but the actual thing that the software checks is the block headers, right? And again, I think you're quite right saying that from the point of view of timestamps, block headers are just a service, right? They're, they're a notary, um, sort of use the terminology. Um, and, and I got to point out, a traditional notion of notary is not the same as what cryptographers kind of call a notary. Um, you know, traditional notaries have legal obligations. They verify your identity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OTS's use of the term notary is maybe a bit misleading. In fact, if I kind of could do it again, I probably wouldn't use that term, but. <laughs> yeah. So basically what this does is that first of all, it gives a publicly verifiable proof, right? So this is public information eh, that, uh, and it's where it's even difficult to give two people different versions of that information, right? Everyone has the same state of the Bitcoin consensus blockchain. Right? Yes. So, yeah. Therefore, you cannot selectively lie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so in in uh, that really comes down to the difference between open time and proof marshal. Open time sense doesn't leverage that everyone has the same state property. You know, it happens to be uh, useful for checking the you know the time part of it, but open time sense doesn't leverage that any further. Whereas my proof marshal project does. Uh -huh. Well, I, th I think before we go into proof, Marshall, uh, let, it's first worth to exploring single-use seals. Yes. Um, 
so uh, this is something that uh, is again one of these crazy things that at first sound like magic, and after listening to you speak for about twenty hours, it, it kind of <laughs> sounds reasonable. <laughs> but but maybe now an, another shot for you to to explain what the fuck are single use seals <laughs> in in a couple minutes. Well, I mean, so I'll, here I'll take a, a slightly different person off to do, which is I'll talk about it in terms of well, if you have a cryptographic signature scheme, I mean. How does that relate to consensus? And as, as you know, I mean, cryptographic signature, you have a, a private key that you hold on to, a public key that you can give out, and then you create signatures from that, right? And because cryptographic signatures are based on math, nothing stops you from using one public key, or you start, you know, really start one private key, public key pair, to create an infinite number of signatures. Which means that while my signature on a message indicates it came from me, it does nothing to indicate that I didn't say something else. And this is very relevant in money. You know, if I own a house and I sign a message saying you now own that house, that message alone is not proof that you are actual, actually the owner because there is one house and I may have already signed it away to someone else. You know? Yeah, this is basically the double spending problem, right? Exactly. You yeah. Spend one coin twice, right? You tell two yeah. different things to two different people, and how do these two people find out uh, th that this other message was said as well? Yeah. So, what we need is a primitive, you know, a like a a mechanism by which you have a signature scheme, but with a magical property that you can only sign once. And if such a thing existed, then that would solve our house selling problem. Because you had this magical thing that you could sign, but you could only do it once. Well, does that thing exist? Obviously, with pure math, it does not. I mean, it just can't, you know. Math is something where you can obviously replicate it. But if you add energy to it, like Bitcoin does, or, you know, trust, like other systems do, you can absolutely solve this. And sure enough, Bitcoin itself is an implementation of this magical idea, which is if you have a transaction output and Bitcoin is working correctly, you can only spend that transaction output once. So you can design a protocol which says, well, we will add additional meaning to signing a Bitcoin transaction output, which means that in the context of this other protocol, it has this effect. And that's where signal use seals comes in. The idea of a single use seal is to boil that down to a public, you know, a private key, public key system with the magical property that you can only sign once. And I call the, that thing a seal. And the seal is closed over some piece of data. And because that operation can only happen once and I can prove that it, or really I can attest that it happened to someone else. Now I can use that as a building block. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, right. We, uh, basically, um, the, you can say that what, once I spent this certain Bitcoin, uh, I will tell you a, a certain piece of information, right? Uh, generally speaking. And because <sighs> the Bitcoin blockchain is public, right? Um, uh, anyone, like this message can, there can only be one outcome, right? Everyone will see the same coin and everyone is waiting for that coin to be spent and ultimately when the spending transaction happen uh it reveals some of the information that interpreted in this well, other protocol i, 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 I think you actually you're, you're you're getting a bit ahead of yourself so you can actually make make that even simpler it's that if you and i agree on the state of the bitcoin headers I'm not talking about the chain just the header and we agree that, you know, the protocol is being followed correctly. The, the bare minimum necessary to prove that a seal has been closed is the Merkle path from the transaction up to the Bitcoin header. And I can give you that data and say, hey, if you think that the Bitcoin blockchain is working correctly, here's your proof that this particular seal has been closed over you know, this hash digest, which in turn corresponds to this other bit of data I'm going to give you, then we can agree that, you know, this has happened. 
And that other data part is then the role of other protocols that you then build on top of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and of course, once we've reached kind of a, a consensus that we are all waiting for this certain coin to be spent, basically. Uh, no, 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 no. You're not necessarily waiting for anything, right? Like, again, going back to the house example, you're not waiting for me to send the house or anything. I am just proving to you that, all right, you now own this house. Right. And this distinction is really important because it, it gets back to what data do people need to share to make the system work? You know, we can make the system scale because we can operate in a proof, you know, in a nothing happens until it's proven mode where you don't care the state of my seal until it's relevant to you. And then I prove to you that the state is now in the state you want it to be. Prior to that point, you know nothing about it. It's completely irrelevant to you. But then I prove to you that it's now in the state you want it to be, and we can then move on. Uh -huh. So the, the verifier is not really involved in the setup process where the seal is defined, right? and then the UTXO is chosen. Um, but the, the verifier only cares after the seal has been closed right? and uh, uh, the transaction has been spent and is confirmed in the Bitcoin blockchain. Right? At that point, you can actually prove that the seal was closed. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really, really important for scalability. And the reason is if you have one seal protocol, you can leverage it to create another one. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you have a single use seal protocol, you can then define a, a sort of meta seal protocol where you create a key value index blockchain. And you define the secondary seal as we have a pub key and a starting point. And we say closing that seal is defined as proving to you that a valid signature for that seal was not published in this part of the blockchain over from, you know, from when it was created to now, followed by a valid signature being published. And because we're talking about a key value indexed tree, there is only one place where that valid signature could be in, you know, in that data set, right? Thus, anyone who can agree on what that data set is can also agree on whether or not the seal has been closed and what it has been closed over. And how do we make people agree? Well, we use single use seals to close over that data set. So, so there are two single use seals used here. First is kind of to commit on the, uh, the data itself, like the actual state uh, that we care about here. Is that correct so far? Well, from the point of validation, it stops it. Whereas the first single use seal is commit to a data structure about many more single use seals. That data structure, parts of that are then relevant for every individual seal. So when you actually do the validation, you know, you start from the top down, which is I give you the data that proves to you that the top level seal was closed. Then I give you the data that proves to you that of that massive tree, the parts of it relevant to your particular seal are this, and they go show that that secondary seal was actually closed properly. Then I go give you the data as in, here's what it was closed over. Here's why it's relevant to you. Uh -huh. So this is somewhat analogous to a, a Merkle inclusion proof, like that you can prove that some piece of data existed in a tree structure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But very importantly, we're not just proving that it existed in the structure. We're proving where it existed in the structure. Uh huh. And why does that matter? Well, because we you need uniqueness, right? Like suppose the protocol was just, oh yeah, I published a valid signature in that tree somewhere. Well, then you'd have to have the data for the entire tree at every single state, you know, every single step to know that a valid signature wasn't already published. Right? Like that's what's so critical about indexing these things so that you can say for this particular seal, the only place that's valid to publish a signature is this subset of it. And that's what makes it scale. Okay, so in, 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 in what ways can we now actually use this? Like, wh where is this mechanism useful? 
Well, you need software to actually go use it, and uh, I'm uh, famously late on writing my uh, proof marshal software and getting all that working. <laughs> I mean, you know, the issue there is there's a lot of moving parts to actually making this feasible. You know, you you wind up. I, I just give a quick example. I mean, the traditional way to go and store data in an application is with a database, and databases just aren't designed to work with this type of data. You know, they're designed to go work with things that can be indexed by key and so on. But they're not designed to, like, get into the nuances of, like, every single element of a Merkle tree. Right? It's, it's you know, it's just not what they, not the problem they solve. So I've had to go rewrite a whole lot of infrastructure from, from the ground up to make this feasible. You know, as an example, like, well, where did I start with this? Well, I wound up having to write a copy-on-write sort of transactional persistent data structure implementation in Rust. You know, it's a uh, it's a bit of a bit of a goat shave, if you will, to use the you know, programmer terminology. And and why why is it that this is so kind of counterintuitive to to previous conventions? Um, probably because most software doesn't work in the client server, or uh, sorry, most software works in the client server model. You know, you have a client and you have a server, and the client trusts the server. Like the notion of proving things. It just isn't how software works. You know, Facebook doesn't prove anything to you. You just trust it. Mm -hmm. And uh, with with this client-side validated state that actually uses... or w Why is it interesting that we combine client-side validated state with single-use seals and open timestamps, basically? Well, client-side va client valid client validated state by itself doesn't really do that much. You know, it's just data that you can validate. I mean, big deal. But when you can make things either have that interaction with time, like Open Time Sense does, or have uniqueness, like Proof Marshall aims to do, then you can implement financial protocols. You know, that's, I mean, RGB does this, um, not with the full scalability that I'm trying to do with uh, Proof Marshall, but, you know, RGB, um, the protocol, lets you buy and sell tokens. You know, moving them around securely, all linked back to the security of Bitcoin. You know, that's a that's a pretty remarkable thing, and it lets you leverage Bitcoin for completely different protocols in a way where there is no trusted authority. Yeah, yeah, and maybe it, maybe to sum or to try to dense this down, this is kind of like we use the Bitcoin blockchain only as well, basically the the double spending protection of a state update in some other mechanism. So we can have this very complex state construction of some piece of information, but if we tie that back with single-use seals onto the Bitcoin blockchain, it means that we can prove that the state did in fact update and it, it only updated in this one specific way. Exactly, yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe a bit more, like, can you speak a bit closer how, for example, what exactly that state is in RGB that makes these financial contracts? Well, I mean, the state there is what is this? I mean, it's quite like Bitcoin itself. What is the state of a transaction output effectively? You know, what is the state of this bundle of coins, you know, that may or may not be spent? So RGB, basically, you go back to some genesis state where, by definition, you say something exists. And then the purpose of RGB is to then show that from that genesis state, we're now in a state where you own the coins, and you can trace backwards all the different times when the coins were split or combined and so on. So this is basically that we create another uh, well, state machine uh, that is not on the Bitcoin blockchain that shows when the token was spent. Right, or, or split apart or consolidated. Um, and that this can be proved on the client side, right? On the, on the client side, we can validate that in fact this is true, but we do not rely on the global consensus information. Yeah. So, so, well, we're relying on the global consensus information, but the transitions in our state machine are not in that consensus, right? Uh, so I think there's two layers to this, right? One is, first of all, you show that there is a series of transitions of the state machine that could be true. 
right? The transitions themselves follow the rules. And then secondly, you go show that the transitions are the only transitions that could have happened, you know, for your particular coin because they're linked back to Bitcoin. And, and interestingly, like, this distinction actually like comes in a very pervasive level in my proof martial work where data validation is contextual. Right? Like normally when you think of validating data, you say, well, I'm validating the data itself, right? There's a series of rules it's got to go follow. Does the data match those rules? But with contextual validation, you're saying not only do these rules need to be followed, but there is this context, namely the states of the Bitcoin blockchain, which has to go match up. And it turns out splitting those two is actually really useful because it lets you distinguish between validating the data itself and saying, is it also valid in the context of what's happened on chain? Yeah, maybe to, to bring that back to Bitcoin blockchain itself, right? There can be a valid block, right? That, that follows all the consensus rules, but it is not part of the most heavy proof of work chain. Exactly. Right? So it's, it's some fork child uh, block exactly. that did not get proof of work on top for whatever reason. And, and, and right? here's what's really interesting about that, which is, when you're, you know, when you're looking at a software maintainability point of view, right, you want rules that are deterministic. You know, you want your validation function to always spit out the same answer for the same input. And by separating validity by itself in, in context, you can make the context part of that not interact with the rest of the validity, right? So, in, in, you know, I'm still working on how do you actually express this in an API, but, my goal with proof marshal is for the validity function to say, all right, all this data is valid. And if it's valid in context, run all these queries against Bitcoin blockchain. You know, the validity function of the verifier does not do those queries. It doesn't know the state of the Bitcoin blockchain. It just says, for this to be true, all these facts extracted from Bitcoin must be true too. Separately check all those. Okay, maybe let's go a little bit deeper into each one of those. So specifically uh, in that RGB context, uh, where do we define the validity of this new state? Is it defined in Genesis? Well, so it starts from the Genesis state, which is sort of the transition between like what humans talk about validity and what the program does, right? You know, crypto by itself cannot say anything about what humans think is valid. So you got to start with something that we just agree on by fiat, right? You know, it's like, is it Bitcoin or is it Bitcoin Cash? You know, the the code itself cannot distinguish between what should what which of those two things should be true. You just have to say, all right, by definition, this is where we start. And then the code goes through the different state transitions, says, did this follow the rules? Did this follow the rules? Did this follow the rules, etc. But, but where are these rules defined? They're defined in software. Uh -huh. So this is basically a, a client-side validated state full node. or full Yes, full node. yes. Uh -huh. You run software that validates the rules, and what the rules actually are is the software. You know, the mm -hmm. definition of those rules is that software implementation. And you can sort of like, you can sort of like split hairs on, well, what is the definition, what isn't, and so on. And that gets to like really deep philosophical questions. But for a practical point of view, the definition is a bunch of source code and like what Rust compiler you're supposed to go run, right? And we're pretty sure that different Rust compilers will give the same results for the same thing. They might not in certain edge cases, but, you know, that's sort of your definition. Aha, that's interesting. And one of the cool things is that here in this client-side validated model, uh, my rules can be completely crazy. Right, and not make sense with anyone else on the network because these are not consensus rules that we all need to agree on. These are like, these are, I'm, I mean, a Bitcoin full node works similar in the sense that it can run any rule set that it wants, but it has more drastic consequences that it forks you off the most, like the largest monetary network, right? If you break the rules. While with client side validated state, even if you run these crazy rules, you, you don't really fork off the network. Yes. So, you know, like this is, this is analogous to why open source is valuable. Open source allows people who do different things to contribute 
to the same shared goal. Client-side validated state lets us have different rules from each other, yet still use the same security mechanism. You know, it doesn't matter that you and I completely disagree on how a token should work. You know, you, you want to go and trade stocks. I want to go trade artwork. It doesn't matter. We can still use the same security mechanism to come to agreements for our respective applications. And indeed, you don't even need to know that my application exists. You know, I mean, you have no idea that I have an open timestamp proof. In fact, I might have a completely new open timestamp protocol that you have no idea about. It doesn't matter. We can still use the same data structure, the Bitcoin blockchain, to come to agreement. Mm-hmm. So the the kind of validity of the entire state is completely up to the client, right? Uh, but there is this context, as you said, right, to put in relation, um, kind of when it happened and that it only happened once. Like these are the two things we put in context. Well, so what I was talking about context with Proof Marshall is, um, you know, how, how you structure validity, right? You say context is, are the rules followed? And then are they followed in this context of some consensus, right? And the reason why you separate them is you want the... The, the rules themselves to always execute in exactly the same way, regardless of context. You know, like just from a software maintainability point of view, I don't want the state of the Bitcoin blockchain to affect how my proofs are validated, except in the one part where I say did or did not something get double spent, right? Right. Like you just, your point is you're trying to decouple these two things as much as possible. You know, you don't want the rules, like, just from a software maintainability point of view, you don't want code that accidentally depends on, say, what the current Bitcoin block height is, right? And that's easy to happen if you mix these two concepts up. But by strictly separating them at the API level, it just makes it less likely to make mistakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's first to check, is this proof, uh, this RGB proof or proof Marshall proof, is it valid in and of itself? Yeah. Right? And then is it also valid in the context of time stamping and double spending protection of Bitcoin? Right? Yeah. Because there could have been a different proof of a state where this different state of the proof was in fact valid, but it was not enforced on chain, right? Uh, it was done before or after. Um, and we can see that because it is not included in the double spending protection of the on chain transaction. Yeah. Uh, like uh, as an example, um, one way you can actually run the open time steps client is you know, there's literally a no Bitcoin option where it never tries to ask a local node. It'll just say, all right, this, this timestamp proof is valid if this block height happens to have this Merkle root. You go find that block height and see if the Merkle root matches. All right. It, it, it basically, it leaves that up to you. And in fact, if I was to do it again, I'd probably change that subtly and I'd actually make the proof format spit out, um, a block hash itself. But, you know, that kind of gets into some sort of nuanced technical discussion there. But the point is, it can check validity independent of whether or not a block actually exists. It's just leaving it up to you to go and check that last part. Yes. Uh, so th- this is really a, a massive win for, well, scalability and, and also privacy, right? Kind of both. Yeah. Uh, because we remove a lot of the, well, important information from the global state consensus. Yes. Like right? where, um, no longer everyone needs to verify every state update, um, because a lot of these state updates are done in this client side validated mode, while only the timestamping and, uh, uh, double spending protections are actually talked about on the main Bitcoin layer. Yep. Yep. Now, how well, can we... Well, so it? concretely, I mean, suppose you wanted a system which could do a billion transactions per second. This scalable CL model could absolutely do that. No problem, you know, no problem whatsoever. If you wanted 10 billion transactions per second, you could absolutely do that. You know, you'd spend a lot of money on, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of servers going and actually processing all this data People could collectively do that. You know, that's the key thing. 
You don't have to have all this in one place. In those servers, processing those huge piles of data for all these people to aggregate all their transactions, they're, they're not trusting the servers. They're just assisting them in getting something done. Um, but it, it scales because not everyone has to verify everything. Right? Yep. Yep. Uh, it's that you only need to verify if you're actually part in that, uh, kind of economic transaction. Yeah. 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 And here, like, how, what, what are the verification costs for, for that person? Well, um, depending on your application, trivial to a lot, right? So what's interesting about client side validated state is the size of the state itself is your validation cost. Now, if we're talking about, say, a house, right, where in entire recorded history, it might have changed hands, you know, 100 times. Well, validating 100 steps is absolutely trivial, right? You know, a computer can do that so fast, your head will spin. But on the other hand, if you're talking about a, you know, a token in a high-speed trade uh, trading system, which might change hands, you know, 10 times per second, 100 times per second, a million times per second, well, every single step, you have to go validate. And that could very well be for one token, gigabytes and gigabytes of data. Now, where it falls in between those extremes depends on your application. And what's interesting, though, is it will never be worse than a centralized system in terms of total work, right? Like, the worst possible scenario is you just outsource this validation work to someone you trust who then specializes in this. But the beauty of that is with client-side validated state, you can pick who you trust. And you and I do not have to trust the same people, even though we're transacting with each other. You know, if you and I are high-speed traders doing, you know, a million trades per second on some automated system, we could spend, the, you know, 100,000 a month or whatever it takes to validate that data, but we don't have to trust each other and we can use different providers to go do that. You know, we, and we're still like, we're still independently verifying this, you know, so you can get all the trade offs you want. Whereas a centralized system, inherently you and I will wind up trusting the same entity and that same entity can be corrupt and there's very little we can do about it. Yeah, that's a nice point. Uh, that kind of distribution of trust to market chosen peers, right? Uh, is, is, is interesting, right? You can verify with someone else's full node and it could be, you know, your uncle Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, who probably won't be uh, like uh, trying to mess with you. Yeah, um, I mean, look at it this way: it's completely acceptable to not run your own Bitcoin full node if you don't care about losing your money. And our goal as Bitcoin developers is to make running that node as cheap as feasible, to make that decision point, you know, be as many people as possible are, are completely verifying. But you know if. If you've got five dollars, right, and are doing some like lightning transactions, I mean, I'm not going to tell you not to go use a trusted hosted wallet. You know, like losing five dollars, so what? I mean, I, I personally go and sometimes use lightning wallets that are completely trusted because we're talking about ten dollars. It doesn't matter, right? You know, I, I'm just not worried about that. There's more important things. On the other hand, for my Bitcoin savings, yeah, absolutely, I have my you know, my own nodes and so on, because it'd be crazy not to for, you know, an amount of money you would rather not lose. And it's so easy to run, you know, it's, it's that amount is fairly low. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's kind of analogous to, um, how would the Bitcoin blockchain actually works, right? The more transactions you have or you make, the longer is your logical proof chain all the way from the Coinbase transaction. And you can, you can always follow the, the previous hop of the transaction, uh, until you reach the Coinbase. And of course, the longer the chain grows, right? The more difficult it is to actually verify the entire chain. Uh, but of course, the nice thing with client side validated state, you don't have to verify all the chains basically. Um, you, but just the one that you're actually interested in, just from that coin that you're actually receiving. And well, what's interesting is that. In Bitcoin, it is a very bad thing if you can do partial validation, right? Because the Bitcoin protocol demands that the entire block get validated for everyone, for, you know, for the whole system as a whole to work. Because 
the validity of all coins is relevant. And it, it, it always has to be. So things that go and try to put indexes on Bitcoin so are actually really, really harmful. Yet with client-side validated state, because the validity of my thing is irrelevant to you, that logic suddenly reverses entirely. You know, like the fact that Bitcoin even has a Merkle tree is actually a negative. Uh huh. Yeah, that's actually true, right? Because even though if in, in this block I have a transaction that is valid with all the signatures, if the same block includes a transaction that creates uh, 25 million Bitcoin out of nothing, right? Uh, that's the problem. Yeah. And also, from the miner's point of view, they can only make money if they have access to the whole transaction output set. Exactly. And this kind of brings up a question that I wanted to ask previously, right? Because as you said in Bitcoin, you have to verify everything, right? Otherwise, there might be some inflation. Um, but uh, the, with client-side validated state, that kind of falls away, doesn't it? But doesn't it also mean that we lose track of how many tokens are out there? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you absolutely can. And when, so with client-side validated state, in fact, the inflation protection really relies on people running correct software. I mean, Bitcoin's kind of like this too, but it's a bit, you know, a bit more visible. What? Probably we're all running correct software that actually enforces inflation. There will be no inflation. But because of the privacy of it, you absolutely can have undetected inflation if people's implementations are broken. But isn't that quite a bad thing, right? That, uh, I cannot detect if inflation happens. Well, just if other people don't run it, the it's rules. just it's just inherent to any system with privacy, right? Like Lightning actually has the same issue, where in theory Lightning clients could be broken and allow for undetected inflation. It's just not likely to happen because we're pretty good at software engineering. Yeah, but actually, right for that sense, it could even be like uh, on chain, right? If you run a full node that uh, you know think that that sees a one Bitcoin receiving transaction but calculates it as 10 Bitcoin, and you give 10 Bitcoin worth of goods all to your clients. Well, this yeah. was basically an, an inflation event, so yeah, yeah. Not, actually... Not well, like, well, like I that. say, it, this the, at, the nature of this problem and how severe it is and how it can fail, inherently, any system that has privacy or scale will always have a bigger risk for inflation because there's just less data to go audit with. You know, you're relying more on the software actually working. That, that's just inherent to how these things work. You know, and you get the extreme examples like Zcash, where if Zcash has a cryptographic bug that allows for inflation, you are really screwed and you may never find out. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and figuring that out is very difficult. Yeah, and this is a really nuanced trade off, right? Because, um, I mean, uh, well, basically, we cannot make the trade off on the base layer, right? If on the base layer, which is op optimized for privacy and scalability, then all verification for the entire economy is out of the bathtub, right? But if instead I mean, we, I, I don't see it as very nuanced trade off, and the reason why is we're pretty good at writing software. It is not hard to write software that reliably keeps inflation in, in you know under control if you're not using crazy crypto, right? And, and the important thing about systems like Proof Marshall and RGB is actual cryptography they use is trivial. You know, you could explain how RGB works or how Proof Marshall is meant to work to a drunk fine arts grad. And I would know. I have a fine arts degree. And I'm drunk really often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, like what I wanted to point out is that even if we have an inflationary event inside this client-side validated state, then yes, there there might have been that in, uh, inflation on the like higher level in this client-side state, but we still have not broken the base layer, right? We still have not had any inflation or any double spends. Well, well, well so I'd put it a different way. We said, if your client-side valid state for your particular token breaks, that's irrelevant to Bitcoin users. It's not their problem. You know, it might completely destroy the value of your particular token. And who knows what you might have to go do to fix that. But it's just not relevant to Bitcoin because it's client side valid state. It's, you know, it has no impact on Bitcoin users. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, you, that's, know, that's... you don't care how busted my open timestamps implementation is. It's just not relevant to you. Mm hmm. 
And this is different than systems like Ethereum, where because everyone is doing, you know, validation on the same shared state, it's very easy for bugs in one protocol to affect others through that shared state. You know, but basically because Ethereum validation is hideously complex and there's all kinds of uh, edge cases there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really fascinating. Like for, for me, this kind of <laughs> really reshapes, uh, like the entire architecture of, of Bitcoin and, and how I, how I, how I used to look at it in the past, right? From just this thing where you can send money to really a, a much more grandiose uh, coordination mechanism. Yep. And a coordination mechanism is a good term for it, I think. Yeah. And we see just the, the immense power of just the double spending protection, right? That that is solved on the base layer just means that we can do so much more beautiful things on higher layer, right? Uh, like these proof marshals where we do rely on the double spending protection for them to work. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. Uh, but still, right? RGB and proof margin both still rely on some on chain activity. Right, that uh, that that you do need to somehow get back on that global parent uh, state, but of course that comes at a cost of transaction fees. So what can we do to kind of reduce the amount of block space we actually use? Well, I finished proof marshal and I get single use seal scaling to work. End of story. <laughs> that's uh, that, you know, that, that that's that's in a nutshell. If I can get that to work and get all that software written, great. Uh, if I can't, well, hopefully someone else does. <laughs> well, well, okay, but what would be the results of a successful proof marshal implementation? It's like, what does the on-chain footprint look like? Um, arbitrarily small. You know, like open timestamps, there is no limit to how many transactions per second people could do. Now, like open timestamps, um, if you and I are using the same aggregation server, you know, we are trusting that aggregation server to go do its job and actually, you know, accept our requests, right? And it can go block our ability to use the protocol. And it's a bit more severe th um, than in open timestamps where it's, where, you know, you need to trust it into the future to be able to go and spend your coin, right? Or close your seal to be exact. But, you know, you're not trusting it for the validity of anything. You know, all it can do is DOS attack you, basically. and like open timestamps, you can use um, N of M schemes so that, you know, any one aggregator can't by itself be enough to go and block your ability to use protocol. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Um, but so you can aggregate a lot of transactions or state updates on the client side into one single Bitcoin transaction as a double spending protection. But still, what do you think is a reasonable frequency to make these on-chain transactions? I mean, it would depend on the use case. You know, potentially every 10 minutes. You know, potentially as, as often as Bitcoin blocks are produced. It just depends on, you know, what people are doing with it. And mm -hmm. like open timestamps, the more money people are willing to spend, the more frequent that update interval can be up to the limit of, of course, Bitcoin itself. And how can the concept of payment channels or Lightning Network improve the on-chain scalability? Well, Lightning isn't really compatible with um, these mechanisms, actually, because Lightning depends yeah. on visibility, right? Lightning depends on you seeing something that's happened and reacting to it. Proof Marshall doesn't work that way. You know, it's, it's a completely opposite approach to scaling things. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe go a bit deeper in that? Why, why is it so different? Well, quite simply, in the client-side valid state, I tell you that something has happened. And until I do that, you know, you don't know that it's happened. In Lightning, you depend on being able to see me publish a transaction that is invalid. Right? Like in, in the Lightning uh, channel, right, you want to be watching what I'm doing to see if I try to go steal your money. And that depends on having a, a shared blockchain where people are seeing that. And that just doesn't fit in this proof marshal model where the size of that shared state can be enormous. You know, there, there, there are very different approaches. 
Yeah. Uh, like, so the fact is, Lightning will always be better for doing very, very fast transactions that have you know that completes in very little latency. Whereas the proof marshal approach, your update frequency corresponds to how big those proofs are, right? So the more the faster you make the update of any particular coin, the more data needs to be passed around. Yeah, and this is basically ever ever growing, right? So the more the more times you spend the coin, basically, the larger its verification will be. Uh, yeah. Continuously. Yeah. yeah. And, and in practice, for you know most of these schemes, there's ways to cut down on that, which is usually you're you're actually involving you know you're talking about tokens where there is a trusted authority defining what the token is, so it's completely acceptable for them to cancel and reissue tokens to reduce proof size. You know, there's a lot of operational advantages to doing this where that decouples the day to day accounting to longer term, you know, validity. But fundamentally, you know, if you want to go and make a payment that happens instantly, lightning is a better approach. It, you know, it just fits better. Now, you can obviously have aggregators that are also trusted not to double spend in the short term. You know, there's a bunch of different options there, but you know that those are different security trade-offs. Aha! Uh -huh. So here, similar as with timestamps, right? Uh, the aggregator of a proof marshal can, in the short term, like if he is trusted uh, to not double spend, it will still be secure, right? But then, ultimately, in the long term, as as eventually the aggregator makes the on-chain transaction, committing to that state, right? That's where we can be sure that it is impossible to be double spent. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's an interesting model where because the aggregator can't get away with double spends undetected, that may be sufficient for a lot of applications. You know, I mean, particularly like you know, commercial financial applications. I'm sure there is no issue in trust, but strongly verify. You know, the alternative right now is just trust. So. There's, you know, this this will work fine. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's so. Do you see like any like because of course verification is always very important here. Uh, that was kind of the theme of the entire show. Uh, so do you think that there are any like major further improvements to make that verification of each token more uh, efficient? Uh, potentially uh, zero knowledge proofs. Although, those things are kind of scary because they add a whole lot of cryptographic assumptions. You know, it's it's quite possible that uh, ZK proofs will turn out to just be insecure. And, you know, maybe they don't work at all. We don't know yet. You know, like, they are in the state where hash functions were probably in the early 90s. And in the early 90s, all the hash functions that people use turned out to be insecure. You know, with only a few exceptions, so it remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so probably a good idea to first wait. <laughs> yeah. But like, w w I mean, in the meantime, right? You're, you're not hopefully just going to do some waiting. Like, where are you currently at with implementing all of this magic? Well, that's a good question. Um, I've got a lot of code to go write and a lot of uh, APIs to go and figure out. Um, you know, I think I made a lot of progress on. Like the data structure layers and so on, but you know, I'm not gonna. I'm not, <laughs> I, 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 I would be remiss to give uh, particular timelines. Um, you know, two I, weeks. Well, yeah, yeah, two weeks. Yeah, always. Yeah. Well, but but how how can we help you, Peter? Uh, because this seems to be a damn difficult problem. So, what are the, some of the things that that well, you were, are? I think one out? thing that would help is to end this call because we've been talking for. Uh, yeah, about uh, an hour and 48 minutes, which I could have been writing code. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Opportunity costs. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but you see, Peter, then uh, uh, this is how much I, I value being with you together here, right? And and you much, you much this is how much you value being together here with me, that you even give up the precious time to write code. So that's a very big compliment for me. <laughs> or maybe... I just see there's an opportunity to go shame myself into working harder. <laughs> exactly. Some public shaming. Why not? Yeah. It might work. So yes, Peter, get back to coding. Write more better <laughs> code faster now. <laughs>
All right. Well, it was nice talking to you. <laughs> yeah, it, it really was a pleasure, Peter. You're working on some awesome things. Uh, so, any any final notes? Any any uh, other insights that you would like to part for the peers? Hmm. Not really. Then we got it all. Yeah. Uh, well, Pierce, thank you very much for joining. Uh, that was a very interesting deep dive into the concepts of client-side validated state and proof marshals and single-use seals and open timestamps and all the crazy things that Bitcoin could do that you had no idea that were even possible. Uh, we, we explained them all conclusively <laughs> in this conversation. Uh, so thanks again, Peter, uh, for stopping by. Thank you.